Welcome to Fighting on Film, the podcast about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to cover it. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourers Bench. I'm Robbie of Barrow Military History. Welcome to another episode of Fighting on Film. Today we're taking a very special look at the 1992 after winning movie and ungentlemanly act we welcome some very special guests from the production writer director Stuart Urban and two renowned actors Hugh Ross and Ian McNeese gentlemen we're delighted to have you here thanks Thank for you. asking it's, it's incredible to have to be watching a film and then to be talking to the director and uh, some actors from it it's it's, uh, it's an absolute treat especially 28 years later that's we're, yeah. I'm very grateful for this for this attention you know for a film that's that old you know we're uh, I mean, yeah. I, me and I, Matt was two, and I wasn't even born when it came out. <laughs> <laughs> so <it's a> <laughs> wow. Well, that says something, doesn't it? Goodness me. No need to remind us how old we actually are, quite frankly. No, yeah. of course not. No. <laughs> um, so the, the plot of the film, uh, it's the first 36 hours of the, of the Falklands War. Um, and it, it just follows the, the experiences of, of Sir Rex and, and his his team and the Royal Marines and the, and the FDIF um, members that were there on the, on that fateful day. Um, so, I mean, is there any, for leading off, is there anything that Stuart, you know, I, I know that you were writing it in the, uh, in the early eighties. Um, is there anything that you sort of, it did anything spark you off for wanting to write a Falklands war film? Okay. I'll just give you a part in history of how I came to, I mean, basically at the time of the actual war in 82, uh, I, I was very, uh, well, I was obviously upset about it, but I mean, I had all kinds of contradictory feelings because I knew people in the army, uh, one of whom was later injured, badly injured on the Galahad, survived that, the burning, and then got killed in a car crash, which was pretty upsetting. Wow. Uh, then I had relatives in Buenos Aires, um, older relatives, distant, but I mean, they were real family. I had seen them and met them. And... Um, I had my brother who would have got, if the tank regiment had gone, luckily the, the ground was too boggy and you know what the Falklands are like, but if the fourth tank regiment had gone, RTR, then my brother would have gone as a reservist. Um, and that would have been, you know, also pretty nerve wracking. So um, those are the reasons I got interested. I then, I wrote a script for a company that at that point was very big in British cinema. Uh, Canon owned a lot of the cinemas about uh, three para, um, kind of also not less strictly fact-based, but yeah. it, it was about, uh, uh, you know, what the soldiers ended up doing and what they felt about the war. And then uh, that was too big a budget and it didn't get made. But at the same time, I, I thought, wow, the siege of government has what an incredible story. Um, I love siege films, you know, yeah. And, and yeah. In fact, yes, there was, of course, uh, uh, another big siege this week of a government building. Um, a lot of <laughs> week, which <laughs> some of them gonna be a lot of films about that. Uh, uh, and um, and I thought, well, let's try and make this. It's much lower budget. The Canon films weren't interested, but a few years later, as how I got it made, when the BBC uh, uh, got interested, it's it's one of a handful of films that actually are about the Falklands War. There's, I mean, there's remarkably few made by both sides, really, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Question I had, Stuart, was there's a film that was meant to Lewis Collins signed on to do a Falklands War film, but it never got made. I, I wondered while I was researching doing this episode, was that the film that your script was? No, no. Mine was uh, was going to be. Uh, we were going to shoot it. This is eighty seven when it was going right, to be okay. eighty six, and um, you know I'd met several of these people from Three Para, had amazing stories. Like I suppose that what they were hoping for was a British platoon. I mean that's a bit what it. Was like and um we didn't we didn't get to casting we had got into pre-production some pre pre-production and then they went bust you know the day i delivered the first draft they, they defaulted on their banking payments oh, yeah. um which is you know the typical woes of a filmmaker would have been my first feature and um you know that that so no and then the other film i mean basically yeah there have been some various films there was once a couple of aborted and then now another one's supposed to be happening there was one meant to be about the one of the ships, one of the Type 42s, um, uh, and that was, it was about to be going, and that got cancelled. Mm. Obviously, there were a few that, of course, had been made. Um, and 
Yeah, like Tumble Down and things like that. Yes, mostly yeah. television films. And then some that touch. Which you know the guy from that, don't you? Uh, Robert Lawrence. I was at his wedding. Yes, yes. I was at his wedding. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, That's a powerful film. That's, yeah, it is. Amazing yeah. chat, Robert. You know, I mean, I don't know how he's doing now. Obviously, it was such a serious injury. I mean, mm. he battled, you know, I wish him well. I, when you've survived what he had, it obviously affects your life forever as a disability. But uh, no, it was, it was obviously a very good film. Yeah. Hugh, um, you played um, Major Gary Newt, and um, Ian, you played uh, Dick Baker. It, um, Rex is, I think, he's like secretary or aide, something like that. I think something like yeah. that. Yes, it's sort of his his right hand. Yeah, sort of chief yeah. of staff, really, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Well, yes, it was. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. How was it? Um, what was it like taking a, a role um, and then learning that you had to go to the Falklands for it? I mean, I, I always I wondered what was that? What was that like? What was the experience of that? Uh, I, I don't know, it was just an adventure and just something that so out of the bloom came from nowhere and it, it, well, it, was, it, it was very exciting and yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, so you just never know as an actor what's going to come around the corners. Of course. Yeah, yeah. You remember. <laughs> yes, I was very lucky because I'd worked with Bob Peck before um, on The Edge of Darkness yeah. and, and, and so we we knew each other from that. And I'd actually worked with the RSC with him for about two or three years beforehand. So I knew him very well, I actually shared a house with him. So I was thrilled to be working with him again. So, so thrilled about that, but also absolutely excited about going somewhere like the Falklands where that this is the great thing about our job is it takes us to places that we would never normally go to ourselves. Definitely. So to actually get a chance to do that is very exciting. And to work on something like this was extraordinary. And um, uh, when I look back on it very fondly, I actually asked Stuart if he had a, um, a copy that I could see because I hadn't seen it in years. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I watched it. Um, he, he gave me a link. And what I was amazed by, the amount of wonderfully strong actors that he put together for the yeah. show. I mean, it really contains some terrific people in there, yes. some great performances. So I was very glad to be part of it quite frankly. And also you turn up to a place like that and it's a little, it's a little haven of England. It's extraordinary. You go all that way and you turn up at the white picket fences and, and, and you, you, you could be in Surrey. It's extraordinary. In the 1950s. In the middle of that place. Uh, I mean, it was bleak too because there was only one pub in the, whole of the island. So we didn't have much sort of entertainment apart from karaoke, which everybody got involved with and the rat party was karaoke as well so it was quite a, a fascinating point from that these people all put together on this little strange place for a short time what did the islanders make of of, of you guys in the production there were spe special names weren't there that, that, yes that i remember they were called or we were called who was called the, the, they were bennies the, the army we were bennies, called them right. bennies so we saw them I mean, or well, some of this, I don't think I actually would ever have said that, but I mean, maybe I did. Um, but uh, yeah, Ebenes was the army term for them or military term. And then we were, and then the Bohemians like us, uh, when I, what was it? When I was, or I think it's the when I was, when I was on, you know, in That's yeah, right. Hamlet. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. When I was on <laughs> the red right, carpet. Because of, when I, that's exactly right, because, because bless him. Ian Richardson, who, who who regaled us constantly with stories of his work at the RSC forever. I, I remember on a wonderful trip that we had to Seal Island to see CB Seals, was constantly being told really about versions of Coriolanus or whatever. You know, as we're looking at the seals, he couldn't he couldn't bother with any of that. Just what when I, when I, when I. So that's what what we <laughs> when, I, when, when I, I, I yeah, right. when I. When I, that's right. That's fantastic. So that's it. I mean I mean, Ian Richardson, I mean, he's, you know, eternally remembered for House of Cards, um, you know, and, and, and its sequels. Um, was was he your first, he, I, I understand Ian Holm was first choice for Rex Stewart. Um, is yeah, there any... Ian, Ian Holm, you know, another great actor, was um, much more of a physical resemblance and uh, much more like the, you know, in, in his um, off-screen persona and his manner, would be more like Rex Hunt actually was. Um, and and uh, Ian, sadly, at the last minute and nearly brought down the production, 
uh, backed out. Um, and that's when Ian Richardson replaced Ian Holm and wasn't who I thought of as the part because I didn't want such necessarily a sort of upper class mm. patrician approach. But it turned out to be great. And, you know, he got, I think he was BAFTA nominated. Uh, yes, I think he was, yes. Mm. Mm. Ian McNeese was uh, Royal Television Society nominated. I believe. Is that right, Ian? It was until I found out it was a complete lie, which was unfortunate because I'd always wanted that. <laughs> no, I think, it was, I think they got it wrong. It, it, it was extraordinary because it appeared on my CV for quite some time and then it was taken off eventually because I think it went, went, it meant Ian Richardson instead of me. Oh, no. <laughs> that's, oh, like when I, when I, that's like when I made another film that was invited to Sundance and then disinvited after I got all the calls from Hollywood agents. Oh, no. They said, we want to represent you. And and I got, great, you know, it's in. And then, oh, then I was told that. it wasn't in. Oh, you've got the part and then six months later the movie's come out and you're not you're not in it and you're like what well, hang on <laughs> he said i have the part <laughs> but yeah i mean I, I i think it's just an incredible cast you know bob peck is, he's in, incredible in it and you know there's major mike mike norman he's major mike spot norman. on isn't he really yeah yes. and, and he and you know like the the comedic beats of your character i mean that's just i think you know i think you're one of the I, I'll, I'll mention it later but there's a part of the movie and i think you just look so cool in it um but, and, and Hugh with your, with your Sterling, I mean, it's oh, it's it's an absolute, it's a great film, and I'm I'm surprised it's not well more well thought of now. I mean, I I, I really hope that. Well, I think hopefully with your interest and with the other interest that's going on, I'm sure that Stuart now wants to get it on BritBox like crazy, don't you? That's what we want to go for. Yeah, it, yeah? yeah. I mean, it's just it is amazing. That it's not on, you know. I think it's yeah. part of the fact that people they 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 want always series, you know. So that's why our friends in the north is on today. I directed Terrific. someone. Terrific. I, I just that, saw that again mm. recently. Excellent. Absolutely excellent. Thank you. I mean, they, they always want series. And in fact, the single film, you know, movie, whatever you want to call it, play, they were calling it at times. So, I mean, you know, was a great part of British television drama and, and is still, yeah. uh, they made some great ones, uh, you know, BBC and ITV, mostly BBC. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I think, it, you know, I think, I think it, it will come on, you know, and then, you know, we very nearly got it re-released uh, on DVD and, and some cinema showings a few years ago, but the BBC were just asking for too high a price. Was it to do with music? Was that what you were talking about the other day too? Or no, not? That, that was the first release. Right. At the time of the film in 92, they were just beginning to do things like Miramax releasing British films, uh, BBC films, and um, they couldn't do it. Uh, whoever it was that we had interested, it wasn't Miramax um because i uh i remember telling harvey weinstein what i directed and he turned away as i told him <laughs> he obviously wasn't very interested um but um it was another company and they couldn't clear it because there wasn't the right music rights but this is a separate issue now you know whatever happens with the film it has to they have to clear all the music the actors the rights um and the, the music was a big feature but i, I I don't know. I might have to replace some tracks, but that, that won't be a problem, you know, if I have to do that. Yeah, some of the radio station scenes are, you know, key to the narrative of the film, but also the uh, Mike Mike's performance. Mike, is it Mike Grady that was yes. uh, that portrayed Patrick Watts, and he, he did such a good job of portraying what was going on to the mm. to the uh, the townspeople in Stanley. And then and I think it's uncanny. You, you listen to the original recording, and then you you, you watch it in the movie, and mm -hmm. I love the way that you've used that because. I, I was watching it again the other night and, and I was like, hang on, there's no non diegetic sound, but hardly any. It's it's the radio or or the sound of the wind and things like that. And I was like, hang on, we're we're meant to be there with everybody because it's such a close knit community. I felt that we were meant to feel like we might have been a, a member of the FDIF or a, a Royal Marine member in the rooms with everybody and, and we were hearing what everyone else was hearing. And I, I think that's such a, a great part of the movie. Yes, thank you. Well, you know, the sound was, I did think of it that way. Um, we had very good sound designers who later, I think, went on to certainly BAFTAs, if not Oscars, that Hackenbacker, who did all the gun sounds and everything else, and 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 yeah, well, great sound recordist uh, and mixer, uh, you know, post-production mixer. Um, but that was all deliberate, and also deliberate. The only composed music was at the very end, uh, on the, in other words, the main story had finished. The epilogue was they return, you know, yeah, over the montage, hundred days later, whatever it was, uh, 
with the task force. And um, so that, that, that was all music that was played on the night. In terms of production, uh, what I wanted to ask you, Stuart, was were there any films that you felt a strong inspiration from or, you know, you you played homage to in, in, you know, in the actual film itself? Because, you know, we have like nods towards Zulu and there's mentions of fuzzy wuzzies coming over the lawn. You know, there's these kind of, as you mentioned uh, a little earlier, um, siege films and, you know, that kind of mentality. Yes. Uh, well, I, I was particularly influenced by the Ealing films. And um, yeah, of course, the comedy aspect. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were actually shooting at Ealing Studios, which was a wonderful oh, wow. privilege to be there on those stages where, where we did the interiors, some of the interiors. And um, we, uh, so, so I was definitely thinking of the Ealing comedies. Um, and I was thinking of Powell and Pressburger, uh, who were a great influence on me. And they're trying to achieve that uh, high saturation color look, which we were very lucky with the weather, it had a lot of sun. A lot of the mm. red, white, and blue. If you notice, you know, the couches and things. You know, that 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 was very much on a very low budget. I mean, obviously, I would have designed it more <laughs> closely if I could have to have had a completely saturated color look, like uh, Paolo, you know, Colonel Blimp, you know, Paolo and Presley. Yeah, yeah. If I'd been allowed, I would have shot it uh, widescreen. At that point, we did sixteen by nine, but then they put a, a kind of pillar box on it for transmission. Now, if we revive it, it'll be shown as it was originally shot, mm. uh, 16 by 9. Which That'd be really something, yeah. It was that time widescreen. I don't mean scope, you know, that, that wasn't allowed then, but we could have showed it 16 by 9. And the, the, so those were key films and, uh, you know, uh, certainly British comedy and, and also the more, you know, the more serious films that of Power and Pressburger and Zulu obviously was an influence, a fact of the sort of British colonial story, yeah project, you know um and um i think those were the main influences really um so what what was the uh the catalyst for moving towards that sort of ealing comedy uh sort of like tone was it the fact that the the, the invasion itself was kind of surreal and you know that it correct. happened on the, the first place, of April the place and... is surreal you know as hugh and ian will testify we were walking around you know bug-eyed at some of this surreal details such as you know the police station yeah with its one cell um uh the the places had these incre this incredible surreal charm of being like sort of 1950s england in a, in a microcosm um and uh you did, i mean and then of course the general absurdity of it like uh, the argentinian writer borges said it was it was like two bald men fighting over a comb the whole war you know it was in itself this <laughs> outcrop of rock you know yeah. uh, and sheep and grass you know i mean it was mad that, so that's what i was trying to capture that it was itself a surreal event um uh, uh, you know, what, what are we fighting for? Was of course a key, yeah, a key question. Not, not to say. That was it? Was it actually the water around the surrounding water that contained special fish for abroad and stuff like that? Was that what they were after eventually, or what? Well, or oil? Even? I mean, obviously, the oil, uh, 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 the, the, the oil and gas prospects and the squid fishing became very important after right. the war, really. After the war, yeah. Honestly, okay. before then, although they knew there were deposits, I really don't think it was a motive of the Argentine government, nor indeed the British government in its kind of on-off defence of the position on the mm. islands. Um, I honestly think it was about... Sovereignty. National pride? Yeah, uh, national pride, you know. Mm. Um, mm. Factors that became, of course, very big later in, in, in things like Brexit, you know, which are... Um, I, I think that it was national pride. Certainly, the Argentinian people felt the island was theirs, and they have they have a reasonable claim to it, the islands. But of course, the the junta, the military dictators, were using it as an ideal distraction from their problems. Yeah. And Thatcher, you know, I would I would say equally was uh, was you know knew that the chips were. I mean, basically, she was finished if she didn't cover up the mistakes of the fact they'd allowed the endurance was going to be run down the whole yeah yeah of course had been run down and, and signals given to the argentinians they wanted to 
part with the sovereignty. So, so, so I think everyone went into motives that the poor people portrayed in the film ended up picking up the can for, you know. But I, I, I you know, I, I tried to be neutral in the sense, no, you can't really be neutral as a mm. filmmaker or a story, but I tried to stick down the line of, look, I just want to present these incredible facts that were presented to me yeah. without being biased if possible. And I can tell you, you know, people apparently, you know, there were people I heard from people in government and the Conservatives Party loved the film, you know, which I was really surprised about. But I mean, I, I, because I, I, I knew what I felt about the war, but I didn't want to say, I just wanted to present it more as a surreal, um, extraordinary experience and, and situation. And here were the characters involved in it, you know. I mean, mm. to me, it, to me, when it starts, it feels almost like it could be a start of a sitcom based on the Falklands. You know, you've got, you've got the, the town and you've got that lovely sweeping shot of the, I think it's like the high, not the high street. Tracking but, shot. Oh, yeah, the yeah, butcher. Is, that's it, yeah. And then it, it develops into this sort of ramping tension, almost thriller-like sort of, are they going to invade, are they not? And then you get your war movie. And I think that the change in tone is very subtle. And I don't think many films get it right from sort of, and keep the comedy aspect as well, because there's lines in it, which are, I mean, I'm, I always laugh, you know, when when the, 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 the Argentine commando has been shot in the in the courtyard there and um, Bob Pett goes, anyone speak Spanish? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, fucking marvellous. You know, I love that line. Yeah. It's such, it's so true, you know, that I assume like, yes, a commander would be like, come on, any of you lads speak Spanish? Come on. You know, it really is. It's true to life. I think this it's the script, really, that, that is, is just... I, I love I love Hugh's first line, where he's, your character hasn't even really been introduced yet, Hugh, and and you say, um, these boys have done just as many Ulsters as yeah. yours, because obviously it's it's Naval Party 8901, and they had twice as many men as they were going to have because the two parties were there, you know, they, they were being relieved. Major Newt's men had been there a year and they were going to go home, and, you know, they, they're all a little bit... Um, there's another great line where you go, um, it's a little bit end of term here, uh, where you explain to um, Bob Peck as, as Major Norman that, you know, um, we, we've got a little bit lax because we're, you know, we're, we're expecting to go home, you know. So there's so many great lines. What was it like, um, actually, you know, those scenes with, with Bob Peck? Because both of your performances, you come off each other really well in those. I think it was a great actor and wonderful to kind of respond listen and respond to. I mean, that's what acting really, when it works, is when you mm -hmm. um, relate very well. Um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, all sorts of things were fascinating. We were talking last week about the thing of Gary Newt's um, uh, slight uh, crush on on the Lady of the Island. Um, and they, they had a bit of a kind of free song, but we weren't allowed to kind of be more than kind of do that with a few looks and winks. Yes, a subtle, yeah. subtle nod. Stuart, would you talk about that moment where you ask Bob to do something uh, like... When you do a true story um, as a film, which I've done quite a few, you know, um, involving, well, I mean, everything from amusing events to horrible murders, um, you know, you have obviously actors who, who are under pressure because mm. they want to yeah. be themselves, but they to, to bring a part to life in a good way uh, and a truthful way. And sometimes you have the real people there. And and it can be a problem, you know, uh, like, uh, and you have to ask the actor what they want because, you know, for example, Ian Richardson felt that he didn't want to have Rex Hunt hanging around or as a sort of general advisor which is fair enough. And Rex Hunt did come to set one day in Ealing uh, to meet um, uh, Ian and the crew and me. And I had already met Rex and Mavis, obviously. Um, but Bob was very happy to have, in fact, asked for Mike Norman. He was very happy. I wanted Mike Norman, the real character he was portraying, to be our advisor and to be on set. And so Bob is, was, uh, sadly, was a, a wonderful person, and but, but a very exacting actor. So if you if you had as a director not blocked the scene right or worked out you know worked out what was best for the actor and the camera the actors and the camera uh, at one point I said so at this point Bob and we were rushing against the clock as always um, so at this point Bob if you can go over there and just get ready for to, it was in the kitchen I think seeing the kitchen where you're going to dash in a certain direction then look up at where are the attackers in the garden. Um, he said, oh, I don't think my character, I don't think I would do that. 
<laughs> and the, ca- the camera was all set up for, what the fuck, what are we going to do? I went around the corner where Mike Norman was having a, co- you know, right, a catering conference. Mike, you know, can you help me out here? And um, he thinks he wouldn't have gone left. Would you have gone left? He said, well, I think I would have actually, or I might have. I said, well, will you go here and tell him that? So he went to tell Bob, and then Bob went to, to take, so oh, great, okay, that's what I'm going to do, he said, you know. <laughs> it was a bit, a bit, I was a bit uh, crafty about it, but. I don't remember much about the catering that we had. Um, do you remember, Ian? I always remember the catering, yes. Well, what was it like? I can't it remember. It was appalling, but, but you know, <laughs> what the, I mean, what the hell? We weren't there for the food, quite frankly. No, no, no. In the Falklands, obviously, everything was very, quite difficult. You know, we had to bring in our generator. It was a Land Rover brought oh, wow. on the, on the uh, TriStar, or maybe it probably came yeah. in from a Hercules. I can't remember uh, what it came in on, the, the Land Rover. But, you know, it was very basic, uh, the catering and the else. At Ealing, you know, at the studios, we had the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the good old canteen yeah. and stuff. So it was a lot. How long were you guys on the island for? I think it was about two and a half weeks or something like that. Yeah. Yes. It was about, yes, yeah, 17, 18 days. I do remember thinking, you know, because we weren't called every day. That there are obviously uh, days when we weren't filming at all. And I remember waking up on those days and thinking the days stretching ahead like a mud flat. Because there was nothing, <laughs> nothing to do. But Ian, um, we went in the wonderful know. rambles. Yes, yes. You and yes, I. Yes, yes, yes. We did. We did when I could walk. To the minefields. The days when I could walk, absolutely. <laughs> we were always worried, yeah, that one would yes, be blown up. Gone. Stuart, you shared your production diary with us, and there's a section where you mentioned that you, you portrayed a penguin. Yeah. Is that right? Did that make it into the film? Yeah, yeah. It's- Ch- I watched it last night and I, I thought it was the part where the um, the guys are like dug in on the beach. Correct. It's and the they night- stand to and there's a penguin that sort of like waddles off. And apparently that was you. Yes. Uh, I mean, everyone said, you're fucking mad, you know. <laughs> I can swear on this. Because uh, basically it's we waited all, right. all these hours for the penguins to perform. And having been so friendly and hung around us, smelly though they were, uh, they, they, of course, as soon as you point a camera at them, they run away. Um and uh, so, so I thought, look, it's day for night. What if we undercrank it, which is run it too fast? And, and because this huge tussock grass on the beaches uh, was so enormous that it came up to my chest, I think, or around there. So I just waddled in a, in a black puffer jacket and a white, I had a white scarf anyway, my white uh, wool scarf and, and a black mm. uh, baseball cap. And that's how I waddled down as the penguin. And, and it, no one ever... <laughs> No one ever guessed that it wasn't a penguin. So you're not only credited really as uh, an Argentine commando officer, that you're also penguin number one as well. Yeah. What I also wanted to ask you, Stuart, was about the actual research you did in, into sort of like the, the invasion itself, because from all the accounts that I've read, it's actually, you know, a very close representation of what happened. Um, right down to the, you know, you even have like a radio message about the APCs being engaged that were coming up to, towards... Uh, Stanley and obviously that would have been extremely difficult to sort of portray um, but you even get those little mentions and nuances in so what lengths did you actually go to for the, the well, research? It, all the film as far as possible you know unlike let's say you know I mean obviously Peter Morgan an immensely successful uh, writer and showrunner has, has created this whole phenomenon of semi or partially or even one quarter true drama uh, but I, I, I prefer to I think the more challenging route is to do, stick as close to the truth as possible. And um, mm. in this case, it was actually a gift, you know? So what, what I had there were interviews with a lot of the actual people portrayed, uh, including the Argentine side. I got to meet Hector Gilbert, the spy in Buenos Aires, the commander Busser, you know, wow. the one who gives his hand. Yeah. Uh, I met all these people. Oh, no, good. I met, must have met, met half the people I portrayed at least. So I had their versions of it, you know, some I couldn't get to meet. Uh, Mm. But um, uh, in general, it was based on their accounts, uh, uh, military and other primary sources, things like uh, people ringing me up and offering facts. Um, Mm. uh, We uh, had uh, all these, all these people were, were my sources. um, And, um, so, so obviously, I couldn't recreate or didn't know all the actual dialogue, but a lot of the lines were exactly what they said. 
Um, of course, Governor Hunt had told me about that whole exchange, and yeah, and gentleman, the act came from that, and uh, uh, you know, and and some of the crazier, funniest, most all the funnier stuff, if you find it funny, wasn't wasn't because I thought of it, it's because it was what was told to me that that's what happened, you know. So one of one of my favorite scenes um, uh, with Bob Peck is his drill hall speech. Yes. Yeah. I mean that's that's an incredible uh, scene. I mean I I've got an extract from it if if you wouldn't mind if I could read a little bit of it. Mm. Um now I haven't bullshit you about the odds. We'll fight until the governor throws in the towel or until we're overrun, which probably means dying. I want you to face that, death. Think about what it means now and when the firing starts forget it. You are the green berets, the royals. That means you will knock seven shades of excrement out of them before you go down. To me, that scene, it echoes, there's a film from 1946 called Days is the Glory, and it's about the um, Operation Market Garden. And there's a scene where um, there's a, a lot of paras in a Oosterbeek church, and they were read out a speech by Lonsdale, their commander. And he said, we are facing troops, um, like we're facing good troops, but not as good as us, um, shoot to kill sort of thing. And it's just a rousing speech. Um, and it really reminds me of that sequence. Um, yeah. It's very true to life. And I is that did, is that what he actually said? Do you, or was it? I mean, I did speak to Mike about it, and uh, and I'd heard from some of the Marines and uh, about it. I interviewed some of those Marines that portrayed, um, and that's basically, I believe, more or less what he said. You know, and a few more expletives, yeah. probably. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, yeah. So, what what was it like being um, being in that script. scene here? He read the script, so yeah, of course. So exactly. he would have checked it. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, no. I'm just trying to remember. No, I just remember being uh, very impressed by Bob in the scene and 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 the, and the speech actually. Um, yeah. Mm. This, yes, I don't remember. It is a long time ago. It's very rousing stuff, isn't it? And of course, your character, you know. Hugh, I mean, he was in an incredibly difficult position. Yes, um, he was on um, the way out and everything. Yeah, and uh, we wonder uh, in the story if perhaps he ceded command. I mean, obviously, technically, Norman was the commander, but you know, didn't know the territory, didn't know what to do really. So, so in the end, they were a good double act. Um, uh, but uh, it must have been an incredibly emotionally difficult experience mm. for Newt because. Norman arrived there raw, you know, ready, but, you know, a complete novice. And therefore, he hadn't put down uh, those kind of roots or att emotional attachments, which Newt had, you know. So Newt was in a very invidious position and, of course, redeemed himself, you know, when he captured those Argentinians inside. Yeah. With that turning submachine gun. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant scene. I think that might bring us to the alley tally. I think that's a good that, idea. Do think? Oh, good. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Hugh, why didn't you go first, Hugh? That's, this is where I, my sterling submachine gun comes in, is it? It is. We hope so. Every, 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 every young actor or every schoolboy dreams of doing something like that. You know, it's kind of like your, your absolute fantasy to feel like you're... And uh, yeah, so it was very, very there is pure joy on your face at the end of that scene, though you can see it. Yeah, yeah, good. That you have you have the broadest smile imaginable. You you definitely did yeah. enjoy it. We could yeah. I could tell when I watched it yesterday. Um, obviously, mm. that that actually happened. Um, Major Newt did fire his his sterling into the ceiling. But one of the accounts that I read when I was doing research um, was that he actually. When he fired first, he had his sterling set on semi-automatic, so he only fired one round. He, he was expecting to put a, a burst into the ceiling, but they, he only put one round in, and then he quickly realised, flicked it onto full automatic, and and carried on his burst. So that that was one of the that one of the, uh, oh. the more interesting things I found when I was researching the sterling. Um, but have, have you have you ever met um, Major Newt, or have you heard from him? I wonder what he thought of that no, scene because no, I, no, I haven't. Yeah, and I wonder what you thought of it all, actually, Stuart. Well, no. from memory, uh, we did ask uh, Gary Newt to contribute or take part, and he was one of those people mm. who just said, "Okay, no thanks," I, or didn't come back to us. Uh, I think he felt the whole was so, uh, you know, I suppose upsetting, or I, I don't know what it was, but he 
he didn't come back to us, but you know, he, he emerges well in the film. I just sense him as being rather modest and quite retiring. Yeah. Yes. I, th I yeah. think your portrayal of him is quite yeah. interesting. Sort yeah. of like he, the scenes with him and Norman, they kind of have like a, a, a charred Bromhead sort of Zulu feel, almost, you know, the interplay. Yeah. yeah. That might, might have, I mean, that might be partly what I, I mean, because Norman reminded me so much of, I was telling somebody at school being in the combined mm. cadet force, the CCF, and Mike Norman reminded me um, in my memory somewhere of being rather intimidated by by the, the powerful executives in the CTF, mm -hmm. you know, the commanders and all that kind of stuff. Although I did end up being a W02 in the end. Yeah. But um, well, it, it was um, it was kind of, uh, and I was, I was, and also we we had very arduous training with Mike, which I was uh, a bit uh, terrified of. <laughs> <but it> was, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't do it. Um, it, it was all extremely good for us, of course. But um, uh, yeah, so maybe that sort of fed into into the into the relationships, perhaps subliminally, somewhere along the line. My my. Um... So you'd you'd already you'd already had experience with the Sterling then, through your combined cadet force days. I don't remember much having a Sterling in the combined cadet force, but. Um, no, I mean, I had, uh, yes, of all that drill yeah. and all that kind of stuff, I remember very well. And uh, we went on one, something once called an arduous training course on the Isle of Arran, wow. I remember, which slightly reminded me of... I of bet the it folk. did, yeah. yeah, yeah. The folk slightly reminded me of the Isle of Arran. Um, yeah, so there's lots of recall going on in a funny way, yeah. No, it's a great scene. I love that scene. It's, it's fantastic. It's really Yeah, good. It's, it's just, it's sort of... Um, it punctuates that tense sort of uh, segment where they're negotiating, you know, the the ceasefire, etc. You know, it's yeah. just and it didn't it did in the actual battle itself that sort of that happened during the ceasefire because mm. they had them rummaging around in the in the loft. So I'll tell you something funny that the consequence. I mean, were, Hugh, were you there when we shot the uh, Argentinians' reactions to to your firing upstairs? I.e., in a, no, I don't think I was. Well, we had these chaps along who were um, actually Venezuelan. I remember. Uh, and uh, playing the Argentinians, and we kept giving them a cue, you know, to react to the gunfire, mm. and uh, they just were shit. <laughs> they just didn't react. <laughs> so in these days, before health and safety, uh, I, I, I obtained this said Sterling machine gun, and I said to the armourer, "When I give you the cue, let off a burst behind their heads." You know, <laughs> and they <laughs> like. like like jack in oh, the marvelous. boxes because that was a real reaction you know amazing yeah, yeah. it was it was pretty funny <laughs> uh, you could never do that now i mean obviously it was a safe distance not like the the rounds were going to hit them no no the, yeah they were behind a screen you know? that's dream job that wouldn't it man <laughs> yeah <laughs> Stu, uh, alley tally pick well i i i, I would bring uh since we're on the subject of machine guns i i would my, my, my love hate relationship was with my own uh, playing in this tiny role of the commando because we didn't have enough, enough people who could speak Spanish, you know, playing Argentinians on the island. Uh, I was playing a commando and hadn't done the military <laughs> training because there wasn't time. Um, that was my excuse, uh, unlike a lot of the cast. And I therefore had forgotten in this w terrible Falklands wind squall and rainstorm and shooting up on the ridge above Government House that I hadn't got the... Uh, safety catch on and I slipped on the rock and let a, a round into the face of my cameraman and I thought I'd blinded him uh, the blank round which you know of course can harm people with metal I was very lucky it didn't happen um but it, it was it really felt like you were in the role when, mm. you, were, when you were looking down at government house and they were firing all these thousands of rounds were fired in that in that battle by the way in the fake battle mm. um and uh and then my other favorite would be the maroon taxi because it epitomizes the governor drove was driven around this maroon taxi uh, with his complete with this you know uh, bad Falkland Islands flag on, and that was his his limousine. <laughs> it was just such a comical and silly uh, and yet sweet um, embodiment, really, of of Britain in that place and the whole absurdity of the war and the fact that it was maroon colour uh, was to me, you know. So those are my two bits of kit that I would put That's forward. Cool. Was that the same taxi that he used that we used in the film or not? Uh, yes, the when we used it in the Falklands, that was the same one, I believe. And then we've got a replica that we used in the scenes in this uh, that we we did in uh, 
in the yard in wow. uh, what was meant to be their backyard in government house yeah goodness me wow Amazing. Ian, uh, do you have an Ali Tally pick? Well, I, I just the thing is the thing that, that I always remember because it was so striking anyway was getting on a plane at Bryce Norton, Aria plane, which uh, flew into uh, um, into the Falklands after a long, long flight, seventeen hours or something, where we'd stopped up at the Ascension Islands to to refuel. And there was uh, when we arrived, we were buzzed by two Japs either side of us that flew us in. Extraordinary stuff. And then we arrived to be met by a very stern officer who told us immediately, do not go anywhere near the beaches because they are mine. <laughs> wow. And we thought, oh, well, we're not going to be doing any swimming at this time, are we? Let's <laughs> frankly, you know, to, you know, there's no sunbathing going on here, quite frankly. But it was, it was a chilling, chilling moment to know that actually it was still very much a sort of, after all those mm. years, five or six years, it was still a, quite a big war zone, really, Definitely. which we were which we were coming into. And it was it was a stark reminder of really what had happened and why we were there, mm. really. Interesting. I think it, they, I think it was just before Christmas, and Matt might know more about it than me, that I think they did just demine the entire island very recently. But Stuart, didn't, didn't, didn't you knew something about that? that, that you, you worked on a, a bit where it was mined and you well, didn't know, is that right? We filmed the scenes that were set on York Bay, much nearer to Stanley, uh, where the Marines that were... Um, portrayed by Ian Embleton, uh, Aidan Gillen and uh, Richard Graham, were, uh, we, we had been assured by the government that uh, of the Falkland Islands that the uh, islands might, this particular beach was not mined or had been cleared. And we found out to our horror later that it had not been cleared of mine. Oh, God. And, and at one point, <laughs> my hat, and in 50 mile an hour winds, my hat had blown off. I got lost. We weren't filming right on this sort of section of the beach that would have been mine because we were back. A bit, but my hat blew off mm. into nearer the sea. In other words, where landing craft would have landed. And that presumably, had it been still live mines, you know, I, I was either lucky or they were wrong. But mm. I mean, it was pretty, we, you know, the blood drained from your face when we found out later that. Wow, fact, that it, would have slowed production it, down somewhat, I would imagine. It would have been just a little just, bit. Just a touch, just a touch. There were signs, weren't there, by the road, the road sign. Weren't there lots of signs to warn you? Yes. But, yes, yes, there were. And Ian, I'm sure when we went on our expeditions, uh, um, I'm sure, I remember going over hill and down dale and all that kind of sort of quite freely rambling around. We did, we did, it's true. Yeah. And we went swimming. I went swimming one day. What was that like swimming yeah. in the South Atlantic? <laughs> well, it was very peculiar. The climate was very odd because it would go from being very hot and sunny to being absolutely freezing in kind of like ten minutes. It felt like yes, but um, it was very invigorating. Oh, we definitely. I assume so. <laughs> so, Robbie, what's your pick? Well, my my alley tally moment. I've, I've time stamped it here in my notes at one hour thirty three. Um, I think it's Major Newt and, and, and Major Norman are talking to Rex about, you know, what, what could we do sort of thing. It's all sort of hit the fan by this point. The, the firefight's well and truly in. And they're in this tiny little room and it cuts to, to Dick Baker, Ian's character. And he's sort of looking, you know, looking over at everyone else chatting and he's just reloading an SLR magazine. And it's only a 10 second clip, Ian, but you look, you look so cool. I, I, I was saying to Matt in, when we were planning this episode, I said, you might think you're cool, but you're not Ian McNeese reloading an SLR magazine in the middle of a firefight cool. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good point you made there because uh, obviously that came from what they told me. And, and in films of this kind, you know, magazines are never reloaded. People always yeah. just have endless... In fact, it was a bloody task to mm. keep those... It, there was so much f f firing that they it was difficult. Well, I liked it because it it's obviously he's a civilian, but he want he's the character's trying to help. So you know him reloading magazines and, and passing them up and passing them on is something that uh, troops in battle would would really find helpful. You know, it's I just I love that scene, and I think Ian, you just you just look so cool in it. You know, <laughs> thank you. I shall remember that fondly. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Um, I've never looked every cool ever since, quite frankly. Oh, frank. no, I think, I think... It was my cool days, my cool you days. Good. You look great as Churchill. You were great as Churchill in, in ah, Doctor Who. Thank you very much. I loved it. No problem. So, Matt, what's your pick this week, then? Um, 
well, Stuart's already mentioned um, the the sterlings on the on the ridge, the suppressed sterlings, and the 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 attack on Government House is really interesting because it's one of the few um, military engagements where sterlings were used by both sides. So there were both um, L two A three sterlings in the Marines' hands and the the naval hydrographers and the uh, the Argentine commandos were also armed with a mixture of um, suppressed and unsuppressed, the silenced and, uns- and unsilenced um, sterlings as well. So that's that's I have two. So that's one. Um, that's me as the sterling uh, nerd just pr- popping up there. But my other Book available one, available in all good bookshops. Still. <laughs> but my other my other um, pick is Ian Richardson Rex Hunt's uh, Browning High Power, oh, yeah. which I think is is really cool because it's so, it's sort of like acts as Chekhov's gun almost throughout the whole film. Uh, Ian's handed the, the the pistol and he and he looks at it and he, it sort of like becomes a foil for his processing of what's going on, and that's that one of good. the things I like about Ian's uh, performance because you can you can tell he's thinking about what's going on. He sort of he, he takes the the uh, the pistol and he's thinking, I'm I'm this is I'm not going to need this 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 isn't going to be we're not we're not actually going to have a battle here it's it's absurd, and then as as the night progresses he, you know you know there's a couple of scenes where he's um, He's seen brandishing it, and he looks down. At it. It's just before he's seen with Don, the groundskeeper. He's sort of realizing that this is actually this, this might well happen. This might we might have a battle. And then there's a great scene um, where the the Argentine commander comes in to discuss the you know the, the surrender, and he has it in the drawer, sort of like half open. He's thinking just in case. And then you know obviously Chekhov's gone sort of fulfills itself and he hands it over as a you know a, the signal of surrender of, of, of both himself and the whole island so i think that's really you know a really interesting sort of like prop for mm. the you know the development of of um richardson's character because he's he's processing the night and this prop is you know aiding him yeah. and there's a great scene with you ian where you you wake him up you knock on his door you wake him up walk in and you turn the light on and Governor Hunt, Ian Richardson's like aiming the gun at you. He's like got you at gunpoint. And I think yeah. you're coming in to like discuss um, Reagan's attempt to talk the Argentines down and you know something yeah. like that. But that's my pick because I think it's a really interesting sort of like yeah, well spotted. That's a good good symbolism. Yeah. One mm-hmm. thing that, um, that that I remember when I first saw the film anyway was the extraordinary thing, Stuart, that you did with the special effects with the traces of the gunshots. Yeah, phenomenal. Which look extraordinary really on the good. screen. I really think that that is a, 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 and it was actually the first time I'd seen something like that, and it really did add to the power of the film. I think that I think they're extraordinary that stuff. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, how was that film, Stuart? It was done well. I th- I'd always been, you know, remember this is before the days of any digital effects, right? So you were thinking, how would we do this? Because this is 1992, and um, I had seen a couple of lousy attempts in films to show tracer fire. So I went and I thought, well, let me let me just see what it's really mm. like, you know. So we were able to get along to a range and uh, a machine gun. I hid behind a, a big, thick wall. And I just wanted to hear, and the sound was also yeah. important to hear what the rounds were like flying past tracer, um, you know, at various distances. And uh, so I could see what it really looked like. Uh, and then I filmed this test um, and um, showed it. To my designer, a great guy, designed the film. Uh, well, there were two designers: the BBC one and the one from the real independent company that got it, who, who was more of a real film guy, young guy, Steve Hardy, young at that time. Um, and um, Steve said, "I know these people, the Cullies, a family of optical effects wizards, who, in fact, later went on to do the Bond oh, wow. films and are brilliant people." He said, "We should shoot this on thirty-five millimeter, the battle scenes." And uh, they will copy your, I, I, you know, I got permission. I knew I had permission to fire outgoing tracer for real on the beach, the same beach where, which was mine or possibly mine. Um, and uh, so we, we had a night scope and we made sure there were no fishing vessels and <laughs> the outgoing rounds from the, the GPMG were real. Um, and so it was much easier for them to say, okay, how should the rounds coming back look mm. like? because they had an exact basis of how to do it. Obviously, on the ridge at Government House, there were no real rounds fired there, um, but they had the basis of actual 35mm film to really trace how you would 
paint that onto the film as it was done. Yeah, all the stun grenades right. going off. and no, it's, it, very, it's very effective. Yeah, it's really powerful. It's very effective. Even when you've got like the odd round sort of ricocheting and you see the, the tracer ping off to the side, that really yes. adds to the realism. Mm-hmm. That's right, mistake in most films, uh, which is you don't see where the tracer goes, yeah. it just flies. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore we saw that actually it flies everywhere. It was hitting the sea and pinging you know, off, yeah. That's, yeah. They, they, that's what they uh, replicated. Oh, well, well, that was a fantastic alley tally this week. I think, it, I think it's probably the... the the top alley we've had so far on the on the podcast one thing i would i would like to follow up on 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 the arms is um where with were, were they provided by an armor or how how involved was the mod was there any sort of like help or was it complete pushback i'll tell you a quick story yes mod issued a, a, a you know cease and desist order to all their units that there could be no help with this film. Wow. um uh, the government was definitely not keen on it being made um which was ridiculous, really. Mm. But anyway, there you are. Um, even though it was the BBC, or maybe because it was the BBC. Um, and um, what happened was uh, we had an official armour at Baptiste, I think, with the armourers. I can't remember, or maybe BBC. Baptiste definitely provided yeah, the weapons. Yeah, I can weapons. imagine so, yeah. We've got, we were the big sort of British film weapons company uh, for, for, for replica, or, you know, blank firing weapons. And they were very good. I've many times used them. And... Um, uh, the bigger hardware. So uh, in the Falkland Islands, obviously we had to have a license to bring stuff in, but uh, there were weapons there that we used, we were allowed to use for the FIDF and so on, the Falkland Islands Defence Force. Um, uh, I don't remember, Hugh, if you remember where your gun came from, your FN or whatever. What... No, I can, no, 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 I can't remember. Uh, but I, but I, from what I remember, the FIDF were allowed to, they decided to help us because it was nothing to do with the British government. They yeah. were their own bosses um, and the governor of the island was very helpful governor fullerton they were much more cooperative and so that's how certainly weapons on the island were obtained and how we 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 uh, did things there um, including even the vickers gun i think it appeared oh no maybe that was filmed in britain anyway they had a vickers gun wow. you know the old world war one machine wow, gun yeah. which actually would have been quite effective yeah, it would have been. but i think it was really useful. not used in action it was deployed i believe but mm. not used um and um uh the bigger hardware, in fact, a Royal Engineers team decided to help us against the rules in Surrey, where we did the armoured personnel carriers coming out of the war water, and they were from a collector, a Soviet, I think BTR 50s, whatever, the nearest we could get to the ones that uh, that didn't exist in Britain, right. the Amtraks mm. that the Argentinians used. And they came out of the water um, with the help of the Royal Engineers, which is just as well because one of them broke down started to take on water and the crew jumped out um, and they had to uh, salvage oh, the thing. <laughs> so I think that brings us on to um, favourite scenes, favourite parts of the film. Um, Ian, would you like to kick us off if there's anything that you particularly love about the film? Uh, I did, just little follow-on things. That, I, I, I mean, because um, because we start off the film with him playing golf right yeah. at the beginning, I sort of stuck with this sort of image throughout the film. You'll see him yeah. playing mm-hmm. with his golf ball throughout the movie. So, so and, and that was one of the things that I wanted to sort of to just get in the film. And there's some nice moments underneath the table where, where he's still playing with it and bits and pieces like that. So I thought that, that was quite a nice little follow on really gives the character some body doesn't it yeah thinking yep, like yep, a golfer yep, yep. how do i how do i play this sort of scenario <laughs> as, a, as a maybe like a golf scenario that fits you know, into that I... whole sort of the dog, foreign office yeah, that the dog did not run away with <laughs> sorry yes, of yes, course yes. Uh, <laughs> for viewers who haven't seen the film it begins with uh, with ian's character playing golf and the dog as happened uh ran onto the green and took away the ball ran off the ball uh, <laughs> yes. so, yeah great um, Hugh? Um, it, well, of course, the Sterling submachine gun, but um, I also remember the uh, evening, I think it was, all the scenes with um, with Ian, because I'd always been a big fan of Ian's because we both mm. came from Glasgow. And uh, it, it was exciting just to work with him, actually, to be in the scene with him. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was, yeah. Much, I remember 
it's just such a it's must have been such a treat you know i mean i the original house of cards my my parents rewatched it when i was young and i i kind of didn't appreciate it because i was only like 10 or 8 years old something like that but i recently rewatched a little few scenes i'm like it's fantastic his delivery the whole sort of breaking the fourth wall i didn't think it'd been done very much okay. beforehand it's just to to be no. in a room with with him i mean it must have it must have been a, an amazing experience you know yeah um i think yeah. it and you know you you play off him really well and you know i think all of you just i think it's just it's just such great performances i think um one of the things that uh, that i always remember about him in fact is the fact because i worked with him before a few times and, and his wife had always come with him. I mean, she was his right hand man. I mean, uh, I mean, so much so that if they were on location in the hotel room, she would have a little burner and she'd, you know, do little post eggs on toast for him, so he wouldn't have to have the, you know, the the the, the food out That's or fantastic. had to go to a restaurant or something like that. And it was, and 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 so it was the real tragedy when she wasn't allowed to mm. come to the Falklands. So he was on his own totally, and he was lost completely lost without and so to actually if you look back on him having to cope with that and then doing the film the way he did it was an extraordinary mm. achievement because he he was he was completely mm. lost without her uh, it was very um moving that side of him i mm. thought yes i remember he sort of retired to his room a lot of the time and but i remember him in the bar yeah. of one of the somewhere having drinks one night and then he sat in a stool and regaled us all with amazing tales of of his former glory at the RSC. Oh, yeah, um, totally, uh, totally, uh, but he was, totally. yeah, very, and Rosemary Leach was very, very good with him and kind of. Um, mm. I have just, uh, just a quick story about Bob and I uh, when we worked at the RSC, sure. just a quick one, which was um, I was uh, with him when his father came down from Yorkshire because Bob is very store Yorkshireman, but his father was trebled that. And he came to see him play, uh, play in Othello. Uh, Bob Peck played Iago, uh, um, and I was with him after the show when, when his father, because he came to stay with us, and his Bob asked him what he thought about the show and his performance, and his father turned to him and said, the seats were a bit hard. <laughs> <laughs> and that really summed up actually where Bob came from. Yeah. So, I mean, Bob, who was very dull himself, but that's that's what his life was like. Yes. <laughs> yes. Extraordinary, extraordinary stuff. He's phenomenal yeah. in the film. Like yeah, he's great. Ian, yeah, Ian and Bob off are amazing in the film. They're they're perfect for the roles and they they embody it beautifully. And I I mm. enjoy all of the scenes that you guys are in with them. Um, so it's yeah. it's a real pleasure to like hear what what it was like to to act you know off off each other. And Ian and I, of course, continued our military adventures together a couple of years later because we did went to the Crimea to do Sharp. Together. Uh, yes, we did. And, yes, um, uh, Matt's a big a, fan. I am. Fun. That's another another day that another story. stretched on like a mud flat in front of us for Crimea. <laughs> I remember that very, yeah. very well. I think actually it was more challenging than the yes, Falklands. Yes, it was indeed. Yeah. Good God alive. <laughs> Why do we do this, you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything you, f favourite part? Uh, I suppose uh, uh, I, I want to pick like three emotional moments. In Good, the film. please do. I feel... Uh, encapsulate the war actually because you know ultimately this is about real events and real people and i would say i would choose uh this scene when the argentine fleet is sailing towards the battle uh towards the invasion uh, which we filmed on hms belfast in the tent oh, uh, i wondered we were, wow. that's really interesting quite similar vessel actually to many mm. of the ones the argentines had that were post world war ii or around world war ii and um, and then when uh, Bussera gives the uh, big speech and they all kneel down for the blessing of the priests, which actually happened. And I and uh, then Ave Maria plays and you have this incredible stillness as we pan across the actual, you know, the harbour at Stanley mm. and all these people about to have their lives completely upheld, uh, upturned and some of them killed. Some of the islanders were killed a few, but a few too many, mm. you know. Um, and this wonderful little community and that, uh, that, the Ave Maria and then cutting to their folk music, you know, mixing their folk music to me was like, that was the essence of what war is about. You know, it's about disruption and destruction of, of, of people's lives yeah. and religion and belief, you know, and what they all believed in. And secondly, I would say the 
moment when uh, the governor is taken away, is dispatched, having lost the battle, the islands are occupied and the, the taxi goes off bearing Governor Hunt away. And we were all actually, uh, certainly Ian, you were there, everyone was crying when we filmed it. Yes, yeah, it's exactly. Really emotional to remember because a lot of people yeah. had really seen that. Yeah. Had really seen that, and they were actually crying for real because they had cried the first yeah. time. Yeah. I remember Alex, you know, Alex Norton, who played the, the policeman, Ronnie. Another Ronnie, terrific performance. He was weeping. I mean, a lot of us were, were you know, mm. <laughs> there, were, there wasn't a dry eye filming that no, scene. No, it was mm -hmm. a very powerful and, sequence. And actually, everyone loved the scene because it was, again, the silly taxi driving off, the Argentine shouting, you know, drive on, drive on the yeah, right. Yeah. You know? uh, idiots you know it, it, it epitomized what you know national control is and what values are mm. and also destruction of a community for no real reason you know um and yeah finally if i can have a quick third moment because it's it really happened was when major norman's character having retaken the island found gilbert the spy in there among the prisoners of war and they had this big look yes in that montage at the end is yeah it's quite something it's powerful valerio saturno i think played Gilbert very good and and Bob and they had this great look mm. you know isn't this shit you know what all of this is about you know so, so. I think uh, um, uh, one of the memories I have is, is talking to Major Norman the real Major mm. Norman to hear that actually when they did get back to England they arrived back in England and they were taken immediately to number 10 Downing Street and it was there that Major Norman refused to shake the hand of Margaret Thatcher wow, because wow. of what she'd done. And that was a very, very telling moment mm. when he told us all about wow. that. Wow, Gosh. of course, you're right. I t t totally forgotten that, which mm. I didn't put in the film because, you know, I didn't want, I wanted it to be about the community. It had that- you didn't want to bring politics into unit. it. Mm. it took, people, I remember people said, why didn't you show the government? I said, why? Because either government, I mean, why should we? It's like, you know, we wanted to show that community yeah. and what it was to be there at that time. The personal aspect of war, not the socio-political aspect of it, I think. Exactly. This is what war does to people, ordinary people, who are all ordinary people in the story. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, it is imposed from above, therefore I didn't want to see the above. Of course. You know? And there's been but, countless things about the, the political aspect of it. So I think to have a more personable, grounded yes, exactly. view of the conflict, especially the start of it, which always gets overlooked, but it was, it was extraordinary that they were completely left mm. alone. That they were left alone to their own devices and what they did on that island that night yes. was was an amazing time. It really was. And of course, had there been a massacre, had, had the, uh, you know, had the Argentines decided to shoot straight into the house all the time, um, you know, or kill, I mean, you know, I'm sure the government would have fallen and then mm. this film would have been very different. Yeah, very, yeah, very different. Very. Matt? Uh, I think I think my favourite is actually Mike Norman's cameo on the football field where where he plays an FDIF. <laughs> yeah, that is that is good. Um, and I, I I think I think that's great. He's he's so like he's he's lying there with an with another member of the FDIF who's eating his you know he's got his pat lunch out. He's having his sandwiches and he's got his flask next to him. Um, and the, you know the 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 Marines that have come from the beach are sort of like fighting their way back through Stanley. And does he have a number four Liam? He does. Right? He has a number four yeah. Liam, yeah, yeah. which is great. Accurate, accurate weapon as used by the FRD. That's right. Um, and, you know, he says, are you coming with us? And he said, no, we'll, but we'll cover you, though. You know, <laughs> and then they don't cover them at all. <laughs> so <laughs> just looking ama <laughs> look in sheer amazement at these lads. That's what Mike, that's what Mike told me happened. Amazing. So. But that's that's one of my favourite yeah. scenes. And the fact that he he decided he wanted to be on camera was was is something I think is is special because... You know, it mm. must have been amazing to have him there as the military advisor. It was. It was. It was. It was. For all of us. For all of us. I mean, a really good bloke, you know. And in fact, Bob and he stayed in touch with each other quite a lot after the show as well. He saw he saw quite a bit of each other after that. Oh, time. he must have been happy with how Bob sort of portrayed him then. That's yeah, amazing. Exactly. I mean, well, my, my other interest uh, is, is the FDIF. And the portrayal of them is interesting, Stuart, in that um in your production diary you know you talk a little bit about how you wanted to be a, a, a little bit more critical perhaps of you know the fact that they they didn't get as involved as as they might have done but obviously in hindsight we have that whole aspect of you know 
the governor was probably thinking about, well, I want to, they are civilians almost, you know, if they were to be, you know, injured or killed in the battle, then it would probably be a bit of a, a bit of a nightmare, a bit of a disaster uh, and a waste of, of life because they obviously weren't professional soldiers. But yeah, I was, I was just wondering as, a, as an offshoot of, you know, what was it like working with the FIDF as extras and, you know, within, um, you know, the filming on the island, the production unit on the island? And then also sort of like portraying them at the same time. You know, I sat down, I mean, like I went there on an original recce. Uh, I think I made contact with them then in November before the filming in March. Um, and, you know, I, I, I sort of interviewed people. I found out more right. this and that had happened. The island, the commander of the FIDF, what was that by that time, I think had died. I don't think I was able to interview right. him. The actual chap who sets... You know, so, so there was a conflicting opinion about whether they were ordered onto the ridge or not. You know, um, Governor Hunt said he did order them onto the ridge. They said they weren't ordered. That hence I cover that balls yeah. up moment in the phone when they phone. And well, who knows? In the fog of war, what really mm. happened? In a way, obviously, it's a miracle they weren't there because yeah. they would have all been killed. You know, against those special forces, that would have yeah. been. Yeah, mm. you know. number fours um, against Argentine commandos wouldn't have been. A fair fight, no. I don't think. <laughs> they, they were heavily armed, though, that unit. Um, so, uh, I, 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 of course, it was delicate because, you know, the fact is that, I mean, they didn't engage the enemy and, and, and one might have expected to, but equally, I certainly wouldn't have if I'd been there, you know, I probably wouldn't have. So I, I was trying to portray ordinary people, you know, very young mm -hmm. and older ones. And, of course, the people who were in the FIDF who had more military, some of the Royal Marines, ex-Marines, like Jim Fairfield, did yeah. go and actually fully fight at Government House. So um, we we tried to show, obviously there was acts of civil resistance, you know, smashing up the beacons at the airfield. Um, they did they did do what they could, but equally it was very, you know, remember, you only had a number of hours really to prepare. Of course, yeah. And uh, I don't think anyone blamed them. I mean, it was, no. people say, oh, you made fun of them as well i made fun of everybody if you hadn't yeah. noticed in the film yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody gets their leg pulled um you know uh, that there's fun at had at the expense of everyone but that doesn't mean mm -hmm. you know that it's a, a critical right. portrait i mean i don't think you can blame um civilian volunteers for for being scared of of going into combat i mean i don't think you can be yeah. you can be critical of anybody being scared of going into combat so I, I think it's if, if people who might think it's an unfair portrayal, I think they need to sort of maybe relook at how yeah. people actually feel when they're told they yeah. might go into a, yeah. a life or death situation. So I, I think uh, Mike, you know, I think we dealt with Mike Hanlon of the, of the, who was the current commander at that yeah. time. You know, they were very cooperative, very open, you know, did everything as far as I know was accurate. Of course, they were all, you know, not portrayed as total heroes, then might have questions, but, there was no general outcry about it at all. I think we had more trouble about the fact I recreated a sign saying quarter sheep, please. The butcher spelled S-H-E-P-E. -E. <laughs> um, you know, and people thought, oh, I was mocking them. But, I, I, you know, I present things as I find them. Mm. I actually loved all those people. Yeah. I didn't say they were stupid or anything no. like that. No, I don't. I don't get that from the film. Before. Yeah, I mean, s some people criticise, you know, that that brilliant scene at the beginning where the lady's taking her sheep for a walk, and and I've seen people say, well, why 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 does the film make them out as being, you know, hicks? You mentioned in your diary that 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 was, you know, she did take a yeah the sheep for a walk. She yeah. really did, and the woman who did it was a woman who'd lost her son in the war, had come to live in the islands, a Welsh guard's mother, and it was actually very meaningful to her to have some fun and, 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 and show what was good and fun and original about life on the island that you could have a sheep yeah. as a pen mm. and take it for a walk. So I, that certainly wasn't meant as criticism no. at all. Not at all. No, I think, I think perhaps people go into it expecting something tonally different. They might go into it expecting a full-fledged yes, exactly. docudrama about the war. Exactly, which is the normal yeah, British realist. Yeah, indeed, realist. and that's not the case with Ungentleman Act. You can imagine if Ken Lo had done the war it would have been a bloody miserable oh god film. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> powerful but quite depressing <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. probably it's probably a very good film yeah, if alice alison steadman would have been in it yeah yeah, um, <laughs> not, not, yeah she, she is mavis as mavis yeah 
I'll just yeah. quickly yeah. say my one of my favorites. It's a, more of a sequence, um, but it's it's this is more from like a, a, a movie viewer sort of uh, angle. But I love the nighttime battle scenes purely for the lighting, the the tightness of the the shots and things like that. It really is mm. it's very visceral. Yeah. It's very quick. You're not quite sure if you're ever seeing like were they Argentinian or were they Royal Marines? I'm not quite sure. You know how many men are there? How many men are there up on the ridge? You feel like, as I said earlier, you feel like you're behind a wall with an SLR waiting to pop up and, and take a few shots. It's, I mean, I, whoever did the, the 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 lighting on that sequence, I mean, I think it's it's, it's really good. Chapman, a very good cameraman, a very kind of old guard BBC cameraman, who was great, mm. a really good guy. It didn't, you know, he didn't. I don't think he's done. He did a lot of big dramas after that at all. Mm. But that was, I think, he, he was lovely. Uh, it's just really. I just think it's such a triumph those those little those scenes you know they they're so they're a small part not a small part of the film but they're not you know that they don't have to be as good as they are if, if, and that's not a criticism but no, it's I just think for a film for a BBC movie in 91 92 sorry um it's it's up there with this like you know pick a a, a really popular war film like Sam Pirate Ryan it's up there in that if you cut that in to other movies uh, I feel like people would be like, well, that's, you know, that's very clever. Yes. You know. Well, uh, Peter Chang did a great job. And uh, by the yeah. way, the close ups in the rocks, they're all in the studio. They were shot. Oh, really? Of miles. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Because it was so tough in that rainstorm and in the Falcon's wind to shoot that we couldn't get all the stock shots on the rocks. So uh, some of us behind the rocks, mm. all that talk on the radio in Spanish was behind, was in the yeah. studio. And it's just a, shots from inside government house when everyone's taking cover and things like that. It's very, I like the framing of every, I like just most shots. I just think it's just a beautifully framed movie. Um, yes. and, and everyone's sort of, everyone's putting in 110%. No one's chewing the scenery. No one's there for a paycheck. It doesn't feel like that anyway. Um, I just think it's such a, it's such a triumph of a, of a film. You know, I can't say anything more really. It's just. Well, I think, I think my, one of my biggest, one of the most gratifying things was that people come back to me and say, I was there, you know, and this was really what it was mm. like, including uh, one of the Argentines who was injured in the vegetable wow, patch. Wow. Who the three bullets yeah. who I met uh, 15 years later or something at a seminar about the Falklands. And he said, well, you know, apart from you putting on the moustache on me, he was exactly like that. <laughs> Uh, it, so that was a big compliment. Yeah. I thought. Well, you can't do better than that, can you? No. I mean, that's that's <laughs> terrific. I mean, that really is. Yeah. One thing I would add to that nighttime sequence is um, Bob Peck's portrayal of Major Norman's sort of like moment of freezing up a little bit. I think that's very yes. powerful. That's a very good scene. Mm. Um, did, was did he did he discuss that with Mike? Was that was that how Mike saw yeah, yeah, it? it? Came from Mike. I, mean, I, I did ask Mike. You know, what was that moment that you? Yeah, you know, because other people say, "Oh, he walked down the corridor, bullets were flying through the wall." You know, those clapboard walls, he didn't duck. But you yeah. know, they, they, they definitely happened that moment by the cannon with uh, Matthew Ashford playing um, uh, the Marine bodyguard. You know, his sidekick, yeah. uh, and you know, the, where they were there at that cannon where it happened. It's wow. it's really powerful, and it's it's yep. it's amazing that. It's a testament to Major Norman's credit that he f he felt honest enough to to share that you know that moment of yeah. Um, yeah. of of doubt mm. of you know fear. No, it's very strong. Also, shows the human the human aspect of of war as well. Again, you know you you know people do freeze, people do have moments of of fear, and I don't think it's it's not something to be shied away from. Um, I think certain not you know I'm not picking any movies out in particular, but certain newer movies try and try and portray the actors as infallible people. Um, yes, but you know it, it's something that I think we need to do more in film is actually show humans as being human beings in 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 battle. You know, it's not natural for someone to be shooting hot bits of lead at you, um, and your your reaction in those moments mm. should be shown as they were shown because you owe it. Well, you owe it to the the people who lost their lives, but you also owe it to the real people who've experienced that moment. It's powerful stuff. It really is. Thank you all so much for, for joining us to chat about the film. Thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. 
Uh, I really appreciated all of your oh, thoughts and input and, you know, yeah. stories about filming and, and what it was like. Mm. We've really, pre we really appreciate you coming on. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye, love. Keep well, keep safe. All the best. Thank you bye very now. much. Thank bye, you bye, bye, everybody. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you for listening, guys. Be sure to leave a like, uh, comment, review on whatever platform that you're listening to and subscribe there as well so you hear future episodes of Fighting on Film. Big thank you to our executive producer, Katie McGuire, for helping with the show. Thank you for listening. See you next time. Bye-bye.